It's Sunday morning, y'all. How y'all doing? Woo! I feel like I throw a yeah. Your head you're not yeah. Uh, all right. Guess what? You showed up on Sunday morning when everybody else was still in bed. Get some cookies. What? You get a cookie. You get a cookie. Ah! What? No! I think I got that one right in that guy's lap. Oh, no, they love this. They love this. You give the people what they want. All right. Yes. Don't worry. There's going to be more of that. Talking, talking to you. Oh, little, little hot mic, hot mic. Hot mic, hot mic. All right. So I guess what we need. But you don't talk. You don't, we're done with that. Okay. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Oh, hi. Oh, wait. Uh, hi. My name is Jessica. Hi, Jessica. You couldn't Nailed say it. hi because I can't. Okay. Uh, uh, do you know any good jokes? You're a stand-up comedian, right? What are we doing? What, 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 what am I? Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. So this charades game is over. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Welcome back to uh, the Pi Gotham 2015, day two. Uh, you guys are troopers that showed up on Sunday morning uh, for the first talk. And you're, you not only have a special surprise of me throwing cookies at you over and over and over again, uh, but that's the man I want to check out. That man. Here's what I saw. I saw myself starting to throw a cookie, and I saw that man deadlocked. <laughs> Coming up. And he just waited. He knows the future. Go talk to him. All right. So, uh, we have a wonderful Jessica McKellar here. Let's give her a nice warm hand. We already have our first question of the morning. James. I have a question. This board outside that says open room signups, what does that mean? Well, James, we need to talk about two things. One, your reading comprehension. <laughs> two, uh, your volume. Uh, so. If you're interested in doing that birds of a feather thing, really, it's open to anybody who wants to get up there with the pen and mark it on the board. Mark down whatever you're interested in. I'm interested in machine learning. Let me put up half an hour of machine learning. People will notice that. People will come to the BOF room, and you'll have some time with other people with like-minded interests. So please use that room uh, to its full advantage, right? Use it up. Uh, any other questions, actually? Yep, there we go. James. So this banner over on the side with the Pi Gotham logo looks amazing. Yeah, I know, right? But what does this banner on the other side mean? What's Big Apple Pie? And what are all these group names that I see on this large retractable banner? Yeah, yeah. So uh, these are hieroglyphs from about 2,000 years ago. What's that? Don't bite. It's in your back pocket. Oh, uh, yeah, it's in my back pocket. Because I want to amplify my butt. That's why. Because uh, it wasn't working before. So, um, this uh, is, of course, the word big. This is a snake with uh, an apple in the middle representing youth and a certain amount of, like, death coming over youth that it craps us all, you know? Uh, this is uh, where it all originated in New York City. Um, this, I, I don't know what this means. I can't read this. Uh, it's not my expertise. Um, this, this is the sign of birth. And uh, down there below, this symbol right here means eternity uh, around us. So um, that's your hieroglyph le lesson for this morning. If you're uh, interested in joining any one of these groups, please do show up at any time whatsoever. It's free, open, enjoy yourself. It's just a bunch of people hanging out, talking about Python, maybe some Flask, maybe some... Uh, other goodies. Any other questions? Okay. Fant oh, 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 yeah. Pi Gotham. Oh, right. Well, how could I forget this? Y'all remember urine movies? We're going to beat them today. Tell you one day of the week where urine movies takes a break, it's a Sunday, right? We're going to knock them out of the water. Get it? Uh, so, tweet. 
You got something to say about Pi Gotham? Let us know. You don't have anything to say about Pi Gotham? Just tag whatever else you were going to be tweeting about with Pi Gotham. <laughs> like, oh, it's laundry day. Pi Gotham. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's get down to it. Let's give uh, another big warm welcome for Jessica McKellar. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, oh, take so it away. Much. Guess what? Python is a pretty popular language. It's a language that is used by hundreds of thousands of people around the world. There are hundreds of thousands of Python repositories on GitHub. There are hundreds of thousands of users contributing to these repositories. And by, you know, we could pick a measure of what constitutes pi uh, popularity for a programming language. And by at least this measure, people sort of looking to learn a new language, Python has an incredibly impressive trajectory there. Python is in yellow here. From a decade ago to now, uh, a, a pretty steep, steady, uh, positive slope. That's great, because I love to use Python, and I love the Python community, and I would like this language to be successful for the long term. But the story gets a little complicated if you use um, some different measures for success. So for example, here is another programming popularity index based on the number of skilled engineers worldwide, courses, and third-party vendors. And for this one, it's a little hard to see through the colors, but Python is the pink one here, and I have some arrows tracking it over time. With this measure, the trajectory is less consistently positive. And when I look at a graph like this, I get to thinking. Because there's a lot that goes into a language and a community, and it can be a little bit hard to distill and focus on what actually matters for growing and sustaining a language and community. Because I want to see that really positive trajectory all the time for Python. So what we're here to talk about today is exactly that trajectory. My name is Jessica. I'm a former director for the Python Software Foundation. I'm the diversity chair for uh, Python. Um, and I, so I'm, I'm very invested in this community on a number of levels. And I've also used Python uh, at all of my, uh, at every job that I've ever had coming out of school. So I've, I've worked through a series of startups and acquisitions. The first one was a technology for rebootless kernel updates on Linux, and all of the sort of desktop client software and the service were all written in Python. Uh, startup number two was a real-time group collaboration tool, which was built on top of Django and a little bit of Tornado. Uh, I'm currently a director of engineering at Dropbox, where we have what is possibly the largest distribution of desktop client software written in Python in the world. We have Dropbox clients running uh, on 400 million users' machines. Um, so I use Python all the time at startups, and um, I want to know so that I can keep uh, starting and selling these companies that are using this language that I love, what actually matters for growing and sustaining this community. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So through the lens of a startup, through the lens of um, how you focus on what actually matters in a very resource-constrained world, which is exactly the world that startups and open source communities live in, what should we actually focus on to sustain this community? And we're going to talk about this in a couple of parts. So part number one is metrics. You're a tiny, struggling startup. Uh, the whole world is against you. How do you actually figure out what you need to focus on? One way to anchor you in this conversation is to think about uh, metrics that allow you to focus on, on impact. And here are a bunch of standard things you might measure in a startup or in an open source community. So one of them is new user growth. So super generically, you're a new service, you're Twitter, whatever, you might be tracking the number of new users per month in your service. And once you have these new users, you might be thinking about retention. So month over month, how many of those users stay active? Really standard retention. How about engagement? You don't want people to check Twitter once a day. You want people to check Twitter all the time, right? So how many hours per day is someone using your service? It's a really typical engagement metric. And then number four, virality. Can I get you, a user of my service, to get other people to use it too? So maybe something about sharing or, or other people onboarding each other in, into a service. So those are four metrics that are pretty common that startups tend to measure in a couple of different ways. 
and you apply these metrics in the context of a funnel. So you start with the whole wide world, and you want to get new users out of that whole wide world. You want to turn them into highly engaged users, and you want to turn them into customers. And you know, what, what it means to be a customer you know, in the Python community we'll talk about, but you know, generally you have this funnel. And you would apply these metrics that we talked about potentially at every sort of segment in the funnel to help you figure out what actually matters, to help you focus on impact. Because this funnel, you know, it starts out wide at the top and it gets narrower towards the bottom. Why does that happen? That happens because people fall out of the funnel, right? So you might have a, this pool of potential new users. They're ready to start using your service and they can't figure out how to do it. It's, it's too complicated, it's poor onboarding. Maybe it's not clear to them what value they actually derive from this service compared to some other service. Maybe your service doesn't fit their use cases. Maybe it doesn't match their workflows. Uh, if it costs something, maybe time or money, maybe the value that they're going to derive from the service isn't worth the cost. Maybe the competitors are better. So you have this funnel and it gets narrower because people fall out of it. Now the flip side of this is you can have a nice, fat, healthy funnel if you focus on the things that will retain people and promote people from level to level in this funnel. So if you have a great onboarding experience, it's really obvious why you would want to use this service. It's great in many use cases and workflows. The value prop is there. You're better than the competition. Then you have this nice, healthy funnel, right? And you would apply metrics. You would measure some of these things to see if you're doing a good job at each stage in this retention process. So you have these metrics, you have this funnel analysis, and then you get to think about this virtuous cycle, this sort of optimized flywheel. You get these new users, you get them from somewhere. You retain them, you engage them. They become these sort of highly engaged users, your customers, your evangelists, and they will help you get new users to feed back into the system. That is this virtuous cycle or flywheel that you want, and when you, when you have this flywheel and this funnel analysis and this metrics, that really sort of anchors you on where you might want to focus your time as a startup to maximize this flywheel, to maximize the value that you're providing and to maximize people staying retained in your system. So that was a really generic case. Let's, let's apply this to Python, the language and community, and see what that looks like. So our metrics are still the same, four, four pretty common metrics. And you know, we could slice this a couple of ways depending on what we really want to pay attention to. So we may be really focusing on Python the language, we may be really focusing on Python the community, but let's slice this a couple of ways. So for new user growth, one thing that we might care about, maybe that uh, <laughs> these strange hieroglyphs on the board that were described earlier might care about is the number of new user group attendees per month. Or maybe uh, as a language, we, we care about um, the number of Python downloads per month. For retention, you might care about ensuring that when folks come to NYC Python, they actually come back the next month, right? So you want to retain users month over month or week over week. Maybe uh, in terms of language development, you want to ensure that uh, someone who contributes their first patch to Python comes back and does it again. So are you actually retaining users and contributors in your ecosystem? And then for engagement, it's like you, you, you know, people can use Python for their projects in isolation, but what we really want here is a set of highly engaged users, people who are collaborating with each other, people who are contributing back to the ecosystem. So things that we might measure here include people who are volunteering with conferences and user group events, people who are reviewing code for other people in various, you know, in, for core Python or for various popular libraries. These are all things that we could measure to measure. And then for virality, you know, how do we get these ecosystems to continue growing? If, can you raise your hand if this is your first time at a Python conference? Okay, so that's a lot of hands in this room, right? Oh, yeah, yes, yes, welcome, welcome. So this stuff is important. A friend recommended that you come, you saw it on Twitter. You, you need this flywheel that gets new users getting engaged and getting their friends involved to continue sustaining, you continue growing at the top of the funnel in the community. Um, another place to really pay attention to is how Python is being used in schools. So that's virality, okay? 
And we have these metrics, and we can apply them to a funnel, right? So we have the whole wide world of potential Python users, people who actually end up learning Python, people who end up using Python for fun or for work, and then people who actually are contributing back to the ecosystem. But just like our generic funnel earlier, people can fall out, right? People can fall out at any stage in this funnel. Um, if you could use Python, maybe you don't because nobody else that you know uses it. Maybe it's not clear why you would use Python over Go, over Ruby, over Java. Maybe you wanted to learn Python, but it was pretty dang hard to set up your dev environment on Windows. Maybe the tutorials were confusing. You know, maybe you don't have a local community that's there to support you while you're learning. Uh, or maybe, in general, it's just like an intimidating way, a community to give back to, or there's weak support for new contributors back to the language. So this is sort of the red negative version, but the flip side is that if we do a really good job promoting people to each stage, then we have this nice fat funnel that's setting us up for success in this flywheel, right? So Python could be extremely popular across a variety of use cases at school and at work. You can have a really, a really clear value proposition, really clear, really effective tutorials, a really strong local and online community that is very friendly and welcoming to new learners and to new developers. So we have the opportunity, we have all of the tools, all of the primitives available to do a really great job at optimizing all parts of this funnel. And then we get to benefit from this virtuous cycle, right? We get these new potential Python users they have this clear value prop, they start using it for fun or for work or for school. We retain them in the community, we retain them in the language, we get them contributing back to the ecosystem and they invite their friends, and then PyGotham is twice as large next year because we've all brought one of our friends. So that's that flywheel we want to optimize, right? Okay, so we have these metrics, we have this funnel, we have this flywheel. And we have to think about all of these things in the context of the market that we're operating in. Right? So we are not the only language out there. Something that we need to be aware of is the competition, how the market is changing, and then keeping in mind and reinforcing our competitive advantages as a language uh, and community. So who is our competition? Now, we, you know, we're all in it together. There are you know, different programming languages for different jobs. We don't have to be the best, uh, the best language for everything. But in general, Python is used uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a bunch of areas pretty regularly, including you know, sort of web, backend, infra, the glue language, very popular as a learning language in schools, very popular in the scientific computing community, et cetera. But other languages are not sitting still here, right? You know, it's become increasingly attractive to be able to use JavaScript on the front end and on the back end. It's become increasingly popular to use maybe more specialized languages for certain types of domains. And we shouldn't forget that languages like Java and C that we like to make fun of um, still have 3x the market share of Python when it comes to actually getting a job, learning how to work, you know, getting, getting a job applying this language. So we have some stiff competition. They're, very, they're working hard to uh, increase their market share at the same time that we are. And they're working to increase market share in a market that's changing. And we could talk you know, forever about how the way that people use computers uh, keeps changing over time, but there are at least two key areas that are particularly important to the Python community, I'd say. One is the web, where, as I said earlier, um, it's becoming increasingly attractive to people use the same language on both ends. The types of websites that people are building continue to evolve. And then also on mobile. If we sell more mobile phones and desktops, what does that mean for us? If most people are doing most of their computing on a, on a mobile device and we are not one of the sort of blessed languages for mobile phones, what does that mean for us? And we don't have to be great at everything, but we have to be pretty good in enough areas that you know, the average person who wants to know how to program has value uh, in our language for whatever domain they want to apply it in. So we have to at least be aware of how the market is changing and be prepared to apply our competitive advantages to stay relevant as these markets change. So what are our competitive advantages? Well, I would argue, number one, we have a very strong community. A very friendly, happy, supportive community. It is very large. Um, it has done a good job of, honestly, being on the forefront for what it means to be uh, 
a very sort of positive and inclusive open source community. This is definitely one of our competitive advantages. Another thing is that it's, it's pretty easy to learn. So I don't know about you, I, so the first, well my very first programming class was actually in Visual Basic, but I took uh, the Advanced Placement Computer Science exam when it was taught in C++. That was not very easy to learn. Uh, and I've actually spent a lot of time talking to teachers in school who teach programming at, at the high school and university level, uh, and I've heard a lot about what a bummer it is that to, to, uh, to, you know, to teach someone who's never programmed before Java, you have to dive into classes basically immediately. I mean, that there's like a ton of cognitive overhead there to get to the fun stuff. So Python is pretty easy to learn. It's, it's pretty general purpose. Um, and it's increasingly popular in schools, so at the university and the high school level and lower. And given these advantages, Python definitely could be the default language learned in school. It's not right now. Java and C++ are still more popular, but we could be the default language learned in schools. It could be the easiest and most delightful language to learn and to share. We could be a great general purpose language for many applications. This is a great world to live in. This would be phenomenal. I would say that right now, however, Python is pretty hard to install. Still, if you're on Windows, Installing Python, installing a compiler, installing all the libraries that you need. Let's say that you're a 12 year old kid and you want to write your first game in Python. Like I dare you to try it, to try to do that experience from scratch on Windows and see what that feels like. I would argue that we're falling behind on the quality of our onboarding. I'll, I'll, I'll validate that for you in a couple of slides. It's very hard to use on Windows. It's hard to distribute. It's still behind some other languages and schools. And we're dealing with an image problem. Python is too slow. Python isn't a language you would use for serious software engineering. This is still what I hear when I go out and I talk to people around the world about Python. So it's a problem. Okay, but talking about problems is boring. What I really want to talk about is uh, how we fix the problem. So that's what I will task us with all together for the rest of this talk. You are the CEO of Python Incorporated. Your job is to ensure that Python is a robust, uh, popular language 10 to 15 years from now. What do you do? What do you do to ensure that? Python can be a lot of very wonderful things. It has some shortcomings right now. Where do we focus? <laughs> I'm not moving. Sure. So where do we focus? Well, remember the funnel, right? Remember the funnel. The greatest impact, the, the, people, the number of people who are impacted is greatest at the top of the funnel. We have our metrics. And when we apply these metrics in this funnel, we have this flywheel. Given what we've learned, what actually matters? Let's start with what doesn't matter. Here's an example of what doesn't matter. This whole debate. This debate does not actually matter for sustaining the language, because the people who care about this are people at the very bottom of the funnel. People who know enough to worry about this are already a very well integrated part of the ecosystem. The, in fact, the place where this does matter is the, the optics, the confusion that it causes for people looking into the system from outside. Because what people who don't already, I mean, people who don't already know about this, they're considering learning Python, what they observe from this conversation is, I am not sure if I should learn Python 2 or Python 3. Or it's weird that this community seems very split-brained about this and I'm not sure if they know what they're doing. I'm gonna learn a different language instead. So outside of the optics, I'm not saying that we shouldn't care internally about this conversation, but in terms of who is actually impacted and will this materially sustain the language one way or the other, very, very bottom of the funnel is who actually is impacted by these discussions. Other things that don't matter include excessive bike shedding about almost anything. Um, including any little language feature, Python is too slow, you know, we were inefficient in how we did something with the PSF. I'm not saying that we shouldn't care about these things, and if your passion is packaging, if your passion is the gill, if your passion is PyPy, you should definitely still care about these things. But What's really important to remember is that we, we can't care about these things at the expense of the top of the funnel. Okay, so what does matter? Okay, 
the top of the funnel is what matters. If the top of the funnel is what matters, new users, retaining those new users is what matters, then what does that tell us? Number one, we should have the best installation experience of any language on all platforms. We should have the best onboarding experience. And we should really invest in a key contributor to the top of the funnel, which is getting people where they, where they start, getting Python into schools. OK, best installation experience, especially on Windows. Raise your hand if you develop primarily on Windows. Okay, there's literally one hand in the back of the room. <laughs> so here's, here's the problem with that, though. Most people on this planet who learn how to program learn how to program on Windows. So we all are developing on, on, on you know, our Macs or on Linux, but the reality is that the average 12-year-old who's going to go try to learn Python, they're doing it on Windows. We have to care about this platform, and we have to make ourselves treated as a first-class citizen, even if a lot of the core contributors to the ecosystem don't use Windows day to day. We have to fix that. Here's a quote from a popular um, sort of annual, or a couple of times a year, there's, there's like a weekly game development sprint. Uh, and that installing Python won't happen here, sorry, is a quote from someone who was considering uh, playing a game that someone wrote in Python over the course of this week. You can't get them to do it because it's too much of a pain in the ass. Best onboarding experience. New users don't know what they need to know, and you need to have opinion on, opinionated onboarding that tells them what they need to know. This often implies that you should have separate onboarding experiences. Separate onboarding experiences for first-time and experienced programmers. Let's go through a little, a little experiment here. Let's pretend that I am new to programming, and I would like to learn how to program in Python. So I get to the python.org, Homepage, uh, I get to a link that says, um, if you're a completely new programmer, click this link. Okay, click this link. Yes. Here's where I get. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Okay. So um, maybe I give up here, or maybe I find the official tutorial out of this. The official tutorial, before you learn uh, how to like add numbers or what a string is in Python, uh, I am subjected to... Uh, some <laughs> okay. Uh, so before I even get to what is a string, what is an integer, like how do I print stuff to the screen, I am uh, I'm subjected to some details about source code and coding, which I definitely don't care about as a new programmer. Okay. What does a good onboarding experience look like for a new, pro and this might be okay for experienced folks, but this, this is what you get if you're a new programmer and you go to python.org. What is an alternative? Let's check out our friends over in the Ruby community. Get started, it's easy. Try Ruby in your browser. You have a little interactive, you have a little REPL in the browser, 15 minute interactive tutorial. This is what the future of onboarding looks like. The future is here in other language communities, and honestly, we've fallen behind on this. And it's not because we don't care. It's not because we're not capable of doing this. It's because we don't spend enough time collectively as a community focusing on the top of the funnel. So I want to see this. I want to see this for us, for Python. If you want to win, if you want to live forever, You've got to get into schools. Why, is, why does nobody learn Perl anymore? Because it sucks. No, that's not true. Per, Perl is a perfectly serviceable language across a variety of domains. The problem is that they lost the top of the funnel game. Nobody is learning it in schools anymore. Nobody's learning it at work anymore. You want to get into schools. This is the easiest way to ensure that you'll be around for another 10 to 15 years. And there are a lot of ways to do this. So, you know, universities, secondary schools, after school programs, it can be actually in the curriculum or it can be, you know, something that you do in clubs on the side. Um, I was recently in Singapore. The only reason I travel anywhere on this planet is to be at Python conferences. So I was, of course, in Singapore for a Python conference. But I was looking at um, the curriculum for sort of one of their leading technical institutions. It's all Java and C. 
you're never going to learn Python in school. And this is true for so many schools around the world, certainly still in the United States. So we got to get into the schools. That's the easiest way to win. Okay. Installation, onboarding, getting into the schools. This is the part of a talk where I would typically give a generic call to action. I would say something like the following. Pick a part of the Python community you're passionate about. Maybe it's kids. Maybe it's conferences. Maybe it's contributing to CPython. Great. This year, do something positive in the community. Great. I'm not actually going to tell you this because that, that generic call to action isn't going to help us here. Instead, I'm going to give you an opinionated call to action. An opinionated call to action will have higher impact because we've looked. You look at the metrics, you look at the funnel, you look at the flywheel, you want to focus on the top of the funnel for greatest impact. What does that mean? This is what you will work on. You and me together. Number one, best installation experience. Number two, best onboarding experience. Number three, accelerated adoption in schools. These are the only things that actually matter if you want to use Python 10 years from now. So what is my... Move my hair out of the way. I'm just no, trying to. You. Okay. Okay. What does this mean? Okay, you, me. Number one, pick one of these. Assemble a working group. Define how you're going to measure success. Define some key metrics for what you're going to focus on, and then go execute on it. And then come back next year, and we'll talk about it. I want to see talks about what we did in this intervening year, about the things that actually matter for sustaining this community. And you're not on your own. There's help. One of the key, one of the, this sort of the secret weapons for the Python community is that we have the Python Software Foundation. We have this nonprofit and stewarding organization that has the ability to connect people, to give you funds to go out and pursue important initiatives. So do it. Uh, if you want to focus on Python in schools, we have an entire committee, the Outreach to Education Committee, dedicated to providing support for these types of initiatives. If the thing that you get really motivated by is this onboarding problem, making our tutorials better, great. We'll buy you the pizza, do a sprint that improves our onboarding. And then we also have a generic grants uh, program for you know, anything else that you might want to apply for. I'm told that there are 350 people when you're not hungover after Saturday night who are at this conference. One project for each of us 350 people equals huge impact in this community. So my pitch to you is let's do it. You, me, one of these three key areas, let's do something this year, come back next year, and let's talk about it. So that's my pitch to you, you are the CEO. It's a volunteer community, it's you, me, we're running the show here, so let's make an investment and let's make sure that Python is a language that we will continue to be able to use 10 years from now. That's my pitch to you, thank you, any questions?